All right, how's everybody doing? This is the Comic Sam, where I want to welcome you to my next video. And tonight we're going to be doing something really special. We're going to be looking at comic book covers that feature a gimmick. And it's one of my favorite things when it's done right. So let's go ahead and jump right in. First up, we got this Spider-Man number one put out in 1990 by Todd McFarlane. And this was my introduction to a gimmick cover. I walked into a comic shop in Butte, Montana, and I saw this beautiful cover with this silver ink on it. And I'd never seen anything like it. And there was also a green cover. It was a variant cover, and I really liked it. And the proprietor of the comic shop said, now this is a special edition of this. Todd McFarlane, the guy who created it, signed it in this gold ink here. And I'll try to get a good picture of his signature. There you can see it. Oh yeah, right there. He really did a good job signing it. And he said on the back, Todd McFarlane had a comic shop called The Spider's Web. And when he'd sign these, they'd put that red stamp on there. And that was kind of a certificate of authenticity back in the day. If it had that red stamp, you knew it was one that Todd had really signed. That's a fun one. He also had just a regular silver one, or the black cover is what they called that. And it was a beautiful cover also. Now, in addition, they had a black cover that was sold in a bag. And this one is my favorite of all of the Spider-Man number one variants. I love this one. They've got the price on the poly bag, not printed on the paper cover. And it's my favorite. And then they came out with a green cover. Now, a lot of people say it's uh, purple webbing or gray webbing, but I don't go by that. I just go by, is it a direct market or a newsstand edition? And this is the direct one that has the image in the UPC box. But I loved the bagged cover here. For some reason, it worked for me. Now, this is the example of the newsstand edition. And of course, you'll see that it's got the UPC symbol down there in the box. And also, the next variant they came out with that one was the Gold Edition. Now, they say that this is the second printing, and I think it is a beautiful copy of that comic. I do like that Gold Edition. Now, they started to do homages to this one, of course, and Todd McFarlane did it in this Spider-Man number 13. And I'm not going to touch very much on homages. It's a gimmick that has been so overdone, I couldn't even scratch the surface. But this is one of my favorites, and I wanted to show it right there. Next up, we got Savage Dragon number one. And this was kind of my second introduction to a variant cover, and I didn't mind it so much. This was one, can you see the difference between the two variants? This one has got blue in the trade dress there, and this one has got green. And they did have different posters inside, but again, I'm just not going to touch very much on variants. It has really exploded lately. But uh, they did have a lot of second printings, which was a gimmick. They'd reprint a comic that was very popular, and sometimes they just changed the color slightly or put a border around it. This is Youngblood number one, second printing, and it's got that gold border around it. Next up, we got Wild Storm Swimsuit Special number one. And the gimmick on this was that it was a swimsuit special. And those are all fine and fun, but it was also a wraparound cover where the image started on the front cover and then continued on to the back. And as far as wraparounds go, that's one of my favorites. But I have a whole video dedicated to that. So if you want to see more wraparounds, you can check that out. Next up is Lady Death Lingerie Special number one. And that was another gimmick that they used to try to sell more comics. And it worked. Sometimes the lingerie or to appeal to the young boys who were primarily the audience was a good gimmick. Next up is Wildcats Trade Paperback. And sometimes they collect the first couple issues of a series, put it in a poly bag, and then slap a uh, number zero comic inside with a new cover and uh, it was kind of a hokey thing. They were not they were kind of undersized comic books, so a little underwhelming, but it was an incentive to buy it. Another one that did that was Harbinger. Now this was Valiant's flagship title and it was a pretty successful one, but they did collect the first couple of issues there and then to get Harbinger number zero, you had to buy that trade paperback. This one was polybagged inside with that trade. Next up we got a mail away comic book. This is a Charleston Chew special. You had to buy a couple candy bars, put the wrappers in an envelope with a coupon and a couple bucks, and then in like six to eight weeks, more like eight weeks, you'd get this comic book in the mail. And I was a sucker for those mail aways. It was a fun thing for me. Wizard Magazine got in on that, where if you bought the magazine, it had a coupon inside with an envelope too. 
and you'd have to write a check, fill out the form, mail it in, and then like six to eight weeks later, you'd get one in the mail. And they mailed them in these flimsy little cardboard things, so it was always a trick to get them and see what kind of shape they were in. But they did come with certificates authenticity also, and that was kind of a fun thing. And I have a whole series on uh, these mail-aways, Wizard One Halves, and if you want to see that, you can watch it. But this was my other favorite one that I'll just mention real quick. It was Sin City number one half. And the, the gimmick about this is this is the one that they reprinted and put in comic shops. And I'll show it when we get to my silver ink specials. Next up, we got Aphrodite 9, number zero. Now, this was a smaller, thinner comic book that they put inside of Wizard Magazine. A lot of times they'd sell it with a poly bag and they'd have just a mini comic bagged inside. And these were pretty good. This is Cliffhanger number zero, done by Joe Maduera. And they were decent comics, a few last pages that introduced you to the series. This is a Dark Victory number zero, so even DC, Marvel, Independence, Image got in on it. But at the end there, boy, their quality went down there. I did not like this Avengers number zero. It was another bagged one with Wizard Magazine. Now, they did have free comic books on free comic book day. You'd go into a comic shop and they'd have a stack of comics and you could pick one out. And they were some good comics sometimes. This Umbrella Academy was amazing. And a lot of times they had a white space on there where the proprietor of the comic shop could put a stamp and identify what comic book shop it came out of. But I like the blank version of it. This Batman Beyond is a great example of an excellent giveaway free comic book day comic book. What a great gimmick. This Dan Dare one here I picked up at a local shop here in Billings and you can see that they stamped the address and the name of the shop on there and a lot of them will have that. Now another gimmick that they had in the 90s was these ash can editions. And a lot of times they'd be uh, free giveaways in uh, like Hero Magazine. That's what this one came out of. And they'd have foil stamps and other gimmicks on top of being an ash can but they'd have uh, other enhancements on the cover also. And they weren't the end of the world. They were pretty well done. I do like this Batman Grendel one here, but there was hundreds of them. They were a dime a dozen. They'd almost give them away. So I'm not going to show them anymore, but I did like this pit. It hooked me. I couldn't wait to see what the actual comic book was going to show, uh, was going to look like. And with that foil on the cover there, oh, what a beautiful image that is. Next up, we got Batman Legends of the Dark Knight, number one. And this was an early gimmick that they tried where they printed multiple colors on the border here. Now, the interior was exactly the same, but you could buy different colors on the cover. Not one of my more favorite gimmicks. And another one that's not one of my favorites is DC put out a ton of zero issue comics. Now, they had an event called Zero Hour, and to kick it off, they put out number zeros for every title that they had that month. And I, this is an example of one. And you could buy a kit where you got all the issue number zeros, and I did it. Next up, we got Uncanny X-Men number 325. And this was not only a wraparound cover, but it was a gatefold cover also. And I'm going to do a video dedicated to those, but I want to do photocopies and lay them all out and have the format right where we can take a good look. The next gimmick I wanted to say was variant covers, and I'm just not going to go into those in this video. And the biggest one that kicked off the overdone variants was this Gen 13 number one. It came out with 13 different iterations, exactly the same comic book inside, but they just put out different covers. Now, J. Scott Campbell did do a handful of them, and it was a fun thing to do, but you could go on and on and show thousands of variants covered. It's gotten out of control. Virgin covers, all that stuff. Now, this next up is a Captain America exclusive Comic-Con edition, and I'm not going to hit on those very much either. They just had special covers. Now, this one did happen to be a signed edition, but uh, we're not going to get into signatures here either. Next up, we got Dark Child number one, and it's another signed copy. Now, this one, sometimes they'd come with certificates of authenticity, and this is a Dynamic Forces one, and they'd have a special sticker on the bag, so you almost even had to hold on to the bag. Pretty crazy. All right, let's go ahead and jump in to the first group of gimmicks that we're going to look at, and these are the photograph 
covers. I do like a good photo cover when it works. And this Shazam number two was my first one that I had ever seen. And it's a picture, a photograph of these kids. And it was black and white. You can tell that they just added color there. And then they superimposed a drawing of Captain Marvel or Shazam. And it just was a fun one. Next up, we got another Captain Marvel. This is number six. And they really did like that trope of, of pictures of kids reading the comic book. And maybe they were trying to say, hey, this is the audience that we want to appeal to. But I think it's a beautiful cover. Next up, we got Spider-Woman, number 32. And this is a Frank Miller drawn cover, but in the background, they used photographs of the Universal Monsters movie posters. They've got Frankenstein, Wolfman, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Dracula. It really is a collage of great photographs. I like that one. It worked. And when a photograph cover works, it's awesome. This number 50 it was about a middle of the road one. I don't know if it worked or not, but it is a fun image. And you can see there's a photograph of Spider-Woman there clinging to the wall. It was a fun one. I do like that. But this next one, Marvel Team Up number 128, is kind of infamous for being kind of a hokey, weird, off-putting photograph cover. Now, I think it was Joe Jusco, the artist there, who was a part-time bodybuilder, apparently, who posed on the cover and a spider-man there and but the way that they the scaled them with the building in the background something was a little bit off they hadn't quite perfected photoshop yet next up we got fantastic four number 268 and this was probably my favorite photograph cover that image of the mask of doom with the glowing light coming through and illuminated inside it really is a fun one i like that cover Next up, we got Elvira number one, and she had such a great persona that you wanted to do a photograph. You wanted to see her. She had personality, and if you're going to do that on a cover, do it with somebody who people really like to look at and is attractive and is fun because you can put somebody on the cover that is off-putting. This Undertaker number zero, it was another giveaway, Polly Bagbone with Wizard Magazine but it did not work for me. That image of The Undertaker, it's like, oh man, I don't even know if I want to open the comic book. But it was an image of The Undertaker on the cover. Next up, we got Trouble number one. And this one is kind of an infamous comic book. It didn't work. It didn't go over very well. It was written by Mark Millar, but they had photograph covers on all the issues and it was just kind of in bad taste. Next up, we got Evangeline, no, swimsuit special number one. And if you're going to do a photograph cover, do it like this, where it's clearly the audience is defined and it's a fun one. And they had a model portray Evangeline and she even got to sign it there with metallic ink. And I do like that one. It's a fun photograph cover. All right, the next gimmick we're going to jump into is price variance. Now, this is the Uncanny X-Men number 423. And this is an interesting comic book. They came out with three different versions of this one. This is the direct sales market that only cost a quarter, and you'll see it says it right there. They also had a newsstand edition that did not have a price printed right here. It's just blank white, and the third version was kind of a recalled air one. It had There wasn't any black ink right here, and in the price down here in the UPC, it said $2.25, and there weren't very many of those. It's a rare one. Next up is Hellboy, The Corpse, and this was a quarter comic book. I mean, whenever I saw that, I was willing to drop down two bits and get a comic book. It was a fun one. I do like that one. They weren't that much lower quality. This is Batman, the 12 cent adventure, number one. And I, I mean, for 12 cents, everybody would just draw a pocket change for it. What a great idea. It did encourage me to read this story. It was fun. Next up, not to be outdone, was Batman, the 10 cent adventure. And what a great image on the cover of this one. And for a dime, I'm willing to roll the dice and buy this one. This was a gimmick that definitely worked. I don't know how they made any money on it. Next up is Superman, the 10 cent adventure put out by DC. And this has got a McDaniel cover and he is one of my favorites. I think he is so underrated and I like his take on these DC heroes. Next up, we got Fantastic Four, number 60, or number 489. Their numbering was kind of wonky then, but this is a nine-cent comic. You can see that Marvel Comics was trying to up the ante and see how low everybody could go. And the answer to that is a free comic book. This Unity, put out by Valiant, number zero, is one example of a free, a giveaway comic. It was kind of a gimmick that got you to read this uh, Unity, Time is Not Absolute or whatever, that ran through all of the Valiant lines at the time. But this has got a beautiful Barry Windsor Smith cover, and it is one of my favorites. They did have an alternate version of that that had a red banner at the top, but I think that blue is just one of the most beautiful covers ever. It's one of my favorites. 
And to bounce off of that is another Valiant comic, The Chaos Effect, uh, and number Alpha or whatever. This was another gimmick that they tried to kind of capture that magic that they had with uh, Unity, but it did not work. I don't think it was a very good cover, and the quality had dropped, and it signaled the end to me in Valiant Comics. Next up, we got Lobo's Back, number one, and this one's got a beautiful Simon Bisley cover, but the gimmick on this is that it has multiple covers. This came out, and it had three different covers on it, and so when you open it, there's another glossy stock cover inside, and you can see that they tried to up the humor on that, where he's doing a shadow puppet there, and then you open that one, and you're like, oh, there was two covers there, and guess what? There's a third one. How fun is this? And this one's kind of gruesome. They, they said, now, yeah, get ready. This isn't necessarily for kids. It's going to be a little gory, a little graphic, and this one had word crosses and all kinds of stuff, and then they did, I got to show you this inside cover here. They did kind of a connect the dots puzzle there, and you can see clearly what it is. But I, I just thought that was a great, fun comic book. Next up is The Punisher, number 57. And this has got a great cover that was done with like a paper bag material, that brown paper, real rough, pulpy. But I think it takes black ink beautifully. And this one was kind of supposed to look like a wanted poster there, but it is also a double cover comic book and the inside is a photograph cover too so it's like a triple hitter oh i do like this one and look at the back cover there it's got a great image done by jim lee but when you open that paper bag type material you've got this photograph cover and i think that they saw that photograph and at the last minute said uh, let's cover that up with this with something else, anything else, because I don't know. I just don't think that works very well at all. But what a fun one. Next up, we got The Invisibles, number five. And this has got another one of those pulp brown paper covers. And I think it works. It looks like a constructivist type image or something out of the 1920s. It just really is a beautiful image. I like that. Next up, we got Archer and Armstrong, number eight. And the gimmick on this was that it was a wraparound cover, but it was also a double comic book. When you look it up in the price guides or whatever, it's Archer and Armstrong, number eight, but it's also the Eternal Warrior, number eight. So that's the back cover there, Eternal Warrior, number eight. And when you fold it out, it's a beautiful Barry Windsor Smith cover. I think he hit a home run with that one. I just think that is a beautiful comic. All right, next up we got Action Comics number 544. And this is the first one that I'm gonna show that features a gimmick of metallic ink. You can see that right up there in the trade dress, they put some shiny metallic gold ink and that really set that comic book off. What a fun issue that one is. Next up we got Detective Comics number 526 and DC Comics must have had a real big fix to get in these anniversary issues. And they wanted to set them off and let everybody know that there was something special going on when they did these anniversary issues. Oh, look at that beautiful metallic ink on that. Next up, we got Crisis on Infinite Earths number one. Now, not only does this have a wraparound cover, but many people don't know that it did feature some metallic ink there. Oh, man. That really did set it off. And let's show a quick picture of this open up gatefold cover there. Oh man, that is a beauty. I do like that one. You don't see it opened up often enough. All right, next up we got Thor number 433. And Marvel wasn't gonna be left behind on the metallic ink fan wagon. So they jumped on hard and they wanted to do this shiny Purple metallic ink on Thor. What a beautiful cover. Next up, we got X-Men number 320. And not only was this got some metallic ink on it, but it was a giveaway. It was bagged with the Wizard magazine. So I was I was buying the X-Men comic then and Wizard, so it worked out good. I didn't have to buy this X-Men comic off the shelf. It came free with my Wizard magazine. Next up, we got Sin City, just another Saturday night. And this is the direct sale edition of that Wizard One Half Sin City that I showed earlier with Marv on the cover. But this has got a beautiful cover there that features some metallic ink there. Oh, you can really see how it sets things off there and they used it in the image Sin City, oh, what a great Frank Miller image that one is. Next up, we got Sandman number 50. Now, this was a special edition. I don't know if they call it the platinum or what, but it did have an all-black cover, but it had some matte on it and some highlighted 
with metallic ink. Oh, look at how those stars are illuminated. And that 50 is glossy with those stars that are in metallic ink and the vertigo sign. Oh, I just think that is a beautiful cover. And if you haven't read this Sandman issue, that's a great one to start on. Neil Gaiman really did weave a great tale. Next up, we got Captain America, number 383. Now, this has got a cover that was done by Ron Lim and Jim Lee. And I think those two should pair up more often. This is a beautiful image. But they set it off and tried to celebrate it with some more metallic gold ink. And oh, doesn't that just look like a coin or something? When I saw this on the shelf, I couldn't help but pick it up. That is a beautiful cover right there. Next up, we got Creed, number one, by Lightning Comics. Now this one came with a certificate of authenticity or whatever. But it is just all metallic ink on white paper, and they just made such a great eye-catching image. I mean, look at how that shine just begs you to pick that comic book up. Next up, we got the Man of Steel number one. As far as I know, this is the very first variant edition comic. Now, when this one came out, this is the direct sale, but they did have a newsstand edition, which had a different image on the front. But not only was this a variant edition, but it did have some metallic ink there on the cover, setting that title off. Oh, that's a beauty. Next up, we got Jonah Hex Two Gun Mojo. And this is another one that featured some metallic ink on the cover there. You can see that it set off that title, makes it glow. Oh, I like that gimmick. Next up is Hellblazer number 63 and this has got a beautiful Glenn Fabry cover there. John Constantine of course but this one is another one that they use that metallic ink to good effect. Look at how it just pops off the cover there. Oh I love these gimmick covers. Next up is Shadowhawk number two and Image Comics wasn't going to be left behind and when Jim Valentino did this series he started with number one that had some foil and boss cover. We'll get to it but this number two he did another gimmick enhancement and it was that silver paint ink on the cover oh look at how it sets off the costume of Shadowhawk and the title there what a beautiful cover that is next up we got zero hour number zero and this was the culmination of that whole zero hour event it went through all their titles with an issue number zero and it wrapped it up with this one they started with issue number four and counted backwards three two one Zero. This was the big finale, the climax of that whole story with a blank white cover, except for that beautiful silver ink there that's set off in the trade dress. Oh, that's great. I like that one. Next up is Catfight, number one, put out by Insomnia Press. Now, this was just an independent one, but they used all silver. It was just a silver sheet of paper that they put black ink on top of. Here. And oh, look at how that whole thing just reflects. It's like almost like you're looking in a mirror there, a sheet of tinfoil or something there. Oh, what a great use of that gimmick. All right, last up, we got Ghost Rider number 25. And when this one hit the stands, I didn't know what to think. You had the transformation of Danny Ketch into Ghost Rider there. You've got metallic ink shining bright. But what really kicks this one off is this centerfold here. As you're reading the comic book, you come to this cardstock in the middle and you're treated to that beautiful image by Mark Texera of the Ghost Rider. I like that. And when you turn the page, there's some more text here, but then that folds out and you're treated to this epic Fold out centerfold in the middle of this comic book. And isn't that fun? Oh, man, what a great image. You can't beat that. When you were a kid in the 90s like I was, there was nothing better than just being treated to a great gimmick. I just think that is a fun image there. All right. Well, thank you for joining me on this part one of comic book gimmick covers. It's one of my favorites, like I said, and these are so much fun. What a trip down memory lane. Well, I hope you'll join me in my next part where we'll jump into die cuts and foil stamps and holograms and 3D and on and on. All oh, these gimmick comics are so much fun for me. Thanks for joining me and have a great night.